Hi class, Mr. Goyt with National University going over Economics Unit 7. Uh, going over with you what you'll see on the quizzes, what we'll be discussing in class and in the class live sessions. So what I'm going to do now is go through um, quickly uh, a recap of the last two video, some of the concepts from the last two videos I just did to summarize so you're ready for that quiz. So here we go. Um, the major goal of the Fed primarily is to promote economic growth and stability and while there's some argument as to whether or not the federal government can do anything to promote the growth and stability of the free market, uh, nonetheless that is the goal of the Fed to promote economic growth and stability. The goal of, of the easy money of easy money policy, um, which there's two ways that the Fed can stimulate growth and and um, work with the market to regulate it so it's, it's um, not going to topple as we've seen so recently. The goal of an easy money policy is to increase the aggregate demand. Tight policy or strict policy, um, you'll see really the, the book calls it tight policy, is to uh, decrease aggregate demand. So easy, easy um, money policy increases aggregate demand. When the Fed sells government securities, one of the things, uh, so some of the things that occur, you'll see, are, is there's a, a money supply contracts are used, um, the bank reserves decrease and aggregate demand decreases. Uh, and of course the Fed can, um, by changing discount, the discount rate, the Fed influences um, how much banks can borrow, the amount of reserves that banks have to make loans, and the interest rate that banks char charge customers. The prime rate is the interest rate that banks would give you if you were their one of their better customers. If you're their real a best good customer, you pay your uh, bills on time and you're never late and you have a lot of money in the bank and they like you because they're making money off of you, but not but not because you're a bad customer or a risk. Um, the bank will give you a good interest rate known as a prime rate. The reserve requirement uh, for those for those reserve rates is, is a is a percentage of the members banks total net transaction accounts and review that in the textbook for clarification. The, a tax that takes the, per, a, the percentage or the same percentage of income from individuals at all income levels is a proportional tax. And remember I gave you the example of Steve Forbes who ran for president on the flat tax, uh, flat tax platform and his whole point was that you want to tax everybody the same proportion because it's unjust to have this kind of selective uh, way of taxing. Now, um, in contrast to proportional tax, you have the progressive tax. Progressive taxes, you remember Obama talking about he's going to tax people that make over $240,000 uh, more, and then Joe the plumber got involved. And So if you were following any of that during the camp campaign, that was an argument over really progressive tax versus regressive versus proportional. And the progressive tax taxes people um, with with a high with higher incomes um, and less from people with lower incomes and that's called a progressive tax. The federal I would think that people with high income would call it progressive. However, they might call it stealing. Um, the federal income, uh, the federal individual income tax for the most part is a progressive tax because of this. Because as Obama was saying, he's going to tax people more who make over two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. So generally, the people that make the majority of the money get taxed more. Um, because it falls more heavily on people in low income groups, the sales tax is a regressive tax. So while there's a lot of money brought in on progressive, by, through, through progressive taxing, the regressive taxing and all the things we buy, whether it be gas, food, groceries, um, diapers, all those things are taxed. And those taxes are considered regressive because they tax the poor more highly as a percentage than the rich. Um, which of the following do state and local governments rely on heavily for tax revenues? That would be property taxes. Remember, corporate taxes bring in very little, if any, money into our states. They don't even do much for our federal government. It's 15, uh, somewhere between 5 and 15 percent, depending on the state and local governments. And of course, with property taxes, that's where your money is going to come in for the states. So as far as the state and local governments, they're going to get their tax revenues from property taxes. Supplied side economists believe that the government should 
take a laissez-faire approach to the economy, make tax cuts, and decrease regulation. This is the going back to our discussion of Adam Smith and his notion of the invisible hand of self-interest, my general greed, whether it be um, to altruistic or, or totally self-centered greed, uh, whether it's my greed to keep my family safe and my, my passion to keep them safe and myself to make money and, and so I can have that flat screen TV, whatever it may be, that those type of urges and those type of interests will drive the economy more so than government intervention. And in many ways this is true. But uh, supply side economists believe that laissez-faire approach to economy to make tax cuts and decrease regulation. John Maynard Keynes on the Keynesian economists on the other hand argue that government should get involved and the government should can regulate or direct the economy in certain ways. Stimulate the economy by taxing and uh, shifting uh, money over to certain areas. While some would call this um, a uh, redistribution of wealth. Redistribution of wealth happens whether or not the rich are taking the money or the government's taking the money. Both a rich group. The argument of course is that the ultra-rich are, are not as corrupt as the government. The government disagrees, says the ultra-rich are more corrupt. And as long as they keep fighting, maybe the middle, the, the middle class will get some money. Um, John, John Maynard Keynes, of course, argued that uh, government should take an active role. And this goes back to our discussions about, um, of course, Coolidge and Hoover and FDR. What policies worked to stimulate economies? And while there's some argument about FDR's ability to jumpstart the economy through Keen Keynesian economics, really, at the end of the day, uh, historians generally agree that his policies did start to pull Americans out of the the Great Depression. If nothing else, it kept them busy, kept them moving forward. And of course, World War II is going to really come in there and be the defining moment for Americans to innovate, to create, and to get their industry moving. Let's go down to here to um, for fiscal policy. There are a couple things that you'll see for fiscal policy, ways that fiscal policy can be directed. And the, th the three major ways that you'll see fiscal policy being debated as the, um, uh, in the textbook, and, and of course, if you turn on the nightly news, are tax incentives, government spending, and public transfer payments. Now, tax incentives can be, if you're a big company, and you're going to invest and, and enlarge your company and spend that money, as the government, I'm not going to tax you as much because you're going out as a business owner and you're creating jobs. The government isn't doing, you're doing it. So I'm not going to tax you as much because that's a tax incentive for you to go out and do something good for, the, for your country and for the people around you and for your bottom line, for yourself. Government spending is another way, going back to Keynesian, Keynesian ex economics. Sometimes the government gets in there when the private businesses aren't doing it, when they're not getting off their duff and getting off the couch to make it happen because they're, too, they're not willing to take the risks because the market is too depressed. The government will step in, take their revenues from taxes, take their revenues from uh, the government reserves, and spend it. And in some cases, spend your taxpayer money to try to stimulate the economy, well, in all cases. Uh, to reduce inflation, Congress is going to increase tax incentives. And of course, national debt is a result of years of deficit spending. One example of this are the Reagan years for all his uh, good, all the good he did to um, try to regulate the economy, uh, aside from other his other political achievements. Um, Reagan uh, was, however, a deficit spender. Um, there's the big uh, argument that Democrats are, by and large, um, tax and spend liberals, as they like to say, as people like to say. And of course, Reagan was a spend-spend Republican. He spent a lot of money because he was so in favor of uh, building our military that it left uh, Bush 41, uh, Herbert Walker Bush, with a huge, um, a difficult campaign when Clinton came along to keep going because he has so much deficit and so much so much debt. Distinguish between supply side economics and demand side economics. That's what you're going to need to do next. I'm going to go let you do that and I'm going to stop here.